Thank you, Chairman Pallone, Ranking Member Deal, members of the subcommittee. I'm pleased to present today the findings and recommendations of the Institute of Medicine Committee on Health Insurance Status and Its Consequences, which was funded by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and chaired by Larry Lewin. It's a particular honor for me to appear before this subcommittee, which I once had the privilege of staffing. Now, the IOM presents its findings formally in rigorous and occasionally dense academic reports. But looked at another way, we present a simple and unfortunately logical three-part story about coverage and the uninsured. Coverage is trending down. The evidence is better than ever before that health coverage matters for access and health. And even the care of the insured may be affected by high rates of uninsurance in the community. And we strongly recommend action. Let me briefly review each area. First, since 2000, we see an erosion in employment-based health benefits, coupled with improvements in Medicaid and the child health program. The net result is that the portion of children who are uninsured has remained relatively stable at 11 percent, while the portion of adults who are uninsured has risen from 17 to 20 percent. The principal cause of that eroding coverage, rising health care costs and premiums, coupled with changes in the economy and the labor market. With cre premiums rising about three times faster than wages, Employers are less able to offer coverage, and employees are less able to afford it even if offered. Our committee concluded that these trends would not reverse without concerted action, and the current recession will only make the problem worse. Second, we find that the evidence is stronger than ever before, that even with the availability of safety net services, uninsured Americans frequently delay or forego doctor's visits, medications, and other effective treatments. And those deficits in care have consequences for health. We see that in particular for those who are sick with serious health care needs, chronic and acute, for which medical intervention can be most beneficial. Again, there is a simple logic here. Coverage and access matter more as our health care gets better. For uninsured children, we see shortfalls in immunizations, in prescription medications, asthma care, and basic dental care, missed school days, and more preventable hospitalizations. Uninsured adults with chronic health conditions are more likely to have received no medical attention in the prior year, and they experience more rapid declines in their health status. They're less likely to receive vaccinations or cancer screening services, more likely to be diagnosed with late-stage cancer, and they're more likely to die prematurely. Fortunately, we also found good news. When uninsured people acquire health insurance, they can experience improvements. Previously uninsured children who enroll in CHIP or Medicaid are more likely to have their serious health problems identified early, have fewer avoidable hospital stays, better asthma outcomes, fewer missed days of school, and more appropriate preventive services. Previously uninsured adults who become eligible for Medicare are more likely to receive appropriate care that improves their health and prevents costly complications. Their risk of death when hospitalized for serious conditions is also reduced. We concluded that lacking health insurance reduces access to effective health care services and is hazardous to the health of children and adults. More importantly, we can now validate for you that gaining health insurance provides substantial health benefits to the previously uninsured. Third, we report on a potential spillover effect. When community level rates of uninsurance are high, the insured population is more likely to report difficulties in accessing needed care and less likely to report satisfaction with that care. We also found that widespread vulnerabilities in local health care delivery, including emergency care, are sensitive to financial pressures that may be exacerbated by high rates of uninsurance. The committee concluded that the trends in coverage and the evidence of adverse health consequences are all too clear. And while we did not advance specific policy proposals, we called for immediate action to address the coverage and cost problems. Stated formally, the Institute of Medicine recommends that the President work with Congress and other public and private sector leaders on an urgent basis to achieve health insurance coverage for everyone and, in order to make that coverage sustainable, to reduce the cost of health care and the rate of increase in per capita health care spending. Thank you. I look forward to our discussion. Thank you, Mr. Ebler. Mr. Levine. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, 
I'm here today to support systemic reform of health care in our country and to advocate that every American have access to affordable health insurance. However, covering the uninsured by simply expanding government programs like Medicaid and Medicare without structural reforms that focus on early identification of people with chronic disease and prevention is not a solution and may in fact make the problem worse, particularly from the perspective of the states. Let me explain. In Louisiana, we're proud of the fact that 95 percent of our children have insurance. Most are covered through Medicaid, and while they have coverage, only 39 percent accessed a dentist last year. Only 55 percent of our infants, 0 to 15 months, received their recommended well-child visits. Our infant mortality rate is the second highest in the nation. Our death rate among children is the second highest in the nation. We have one of the highest rates of insured children, but the real question is, does that alone, does the Medicaid one-size fee fee-for-all system uh, provide the access, proper diagnosis, and coordination of needed services. Structurally, we argue it doesn't. Considering that 56 percent of our Medicaid population is African American and nationally 56 percent of the Medicaid population is minority, we are literally, as a matter of practice, institutionalizing the very disparities that we all want to address. Who is accountable for the fact that 30 percent of what we're spending does nothing to improve health outcomes? In what industry would a purchaser accept paying a 30 percent premium for services that don't add value? Medicaid and Medicare were originally designed simply to pay claims, a financial process at its worst, breeding waste, corruption, and fraud, and at its best, supporting payment policies that incent legal but unnecessary and sometimes even harmful care. Many argue the low administrative cost of Medicaid and Medicare are reason enough to expand a government solution. I argue it doesn't cost anything to simply pay claims. The comparison simply isn't, isn't a fair comparison. The hidden cost of the inefficiencies caused by not coordinating care, not managing chronic illness, and chasing fraud costs tens of billions of dollars each year that's not counted towards the administrative cost. To quote Dr. Emanuel, special advisor to the President on health care reform, the health care delivery system is a fragmented fee-for-service arrangement emphasizing delivery of more services rather than the right services. I couldn't agree more. Why is the C-section rate 12.5 percent in Minneapolis but 26 percent in South Florida? Why does Louisiana have the highest Medicare cost per capita but the worst health outcomes? Just last week, three more physicians in South Florida were arrested for infusion therapy fraud. In 2005, providers in two South Florida counties submitted more than $2.2 billion in claims for infusion therapy, 22 times the total filed by the rest of the country combined even though only 8 percent of the HIV AIDS population lives in South Florida. We'll never catch up with fraud or inefficiency if our system is designed to pay claims first and then ask questions later. It's simply difficult to manage. Even states are forced to resort to gimmicks in Medicaid to optimize federal funding, a persistent source of frustration for Congress, the executive branch, and for the states. We believe the solution is a structural reform that provides each American with access to health insurance, harnessing the resources and infrastructure of the private sector and government. Consumers should have a choice with government acting in its proper role of ensuring transparency and providing the system with proper oversight. I again agree with Dr. Emanuel, the President's advisor, who has said the advocates for a single-payer system fail to recognize the very organizations with the infrastructure necessary to coordinate care and implement the technology to develop rational payment models are the very insurance organizations they disfavor. Opportunities exist to correct the tax code to eliminate the bias against individuals, particularly low-income individuals, rather than segregate the poor into government programs like Medicaid where they are confined without choice to poor outcomes, low-income Americans could be provided with premium assistance and be permitted to choose their own certified health plan that meets stringent requirements. The premium should be risk-adjusted and align the financial incentives with early identification of people with chronic conditions so they can be properly managed. Each plan should be measured publicly on key performance metrics, particularly for children, and we should focus on things like management of chronic disease, engaging consumers in their own behaviors, and I will tell you the evidence, as I'll talk about during the Q&A, shows that these models work. They've worked in California, they've worked in New York, they've worked in states in Arizona, they've worked in states all over the country. And we've shown actually that hos avoidable hospitalizations were reduced by 30 percent for minorities in California by using this model. I look forward to answering your questions, particularly as it relates to the medical home model 
We think that has to be the heart of any reform, as well as investment in creating more primary care physicians and dealing with the medical liability system. Mr. Chairman, I appreciate the, the, the opportunity. Thank you. Dr. Williamson. Good afternoon, Chairman Pallone and Ranking Member Mr. Deal, members of the committee. My name is Todd Williamson, and I want to thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today on an issue that is vitally important to my profession and my patients. I'm particularly pleased that you have included on this panel an actively practicing physician who sees patients on a daily basis. I'm a medical doctor, board certified in neurology, and practice in Lawrenceville, Georgia. I also have the privilege of serving as the president of the Medical Association of Georgia and am testifying on behalf of six state medical societies representing more than 35,000 physicians. Medical care in America became the best in the world because of the patient-physician relationship and the right of a patient to select his or her own physician. Patients had the right to privately contract with a physician of their choice. Decisions regarding care and the cost of care were made as part of this coveted relationship. This relationship and the profession it fostered served patients well and attracted bright young men and women into a rewarding field of service to their community. Clearly now something has changed. The private practice of medicine, once the backbone of America's medical care system, has become nearly untenable. Many newly trained physicians do not have the option of going into private practice because of large educational debt and high practice startup costs. This is especially true for primary care specialties. In many communities, only older established practices are feasible and new physicians are rare. In my home county of Gwinnett, the population has nearly doubled during my practice tenure, but the number of full-time practicing neurologists has remained nearly constant. The number of primary care physicians has not kept pace with the population, and the number of general surgeons has actually declined. This means that it is more difficult for patients to see the doctor of their choice. How did this happen? And the answer lies in examining how we pay for our medical care. Initially, health insurance was a mechanism for distributing risk, not a means of paying for all medical care services. Soon after third parties began paying for medical care, they began controlling the delivery of medical care. Medical decisions have become the business of third-party payers, causing delays in the delivery of care. Our patients have lost the ability to choose where they receive care, and physicians are faced with take-it-or-leave-it contracts offered by large health plans. As the impact of third-party payers increased, administrative burdens were placed on physicians. When I started practice nearly 15 years ago, my office of four doctors employed one person to submit insurance claims. We are now down to three doctors, but we have three full-time employees just to manage insurance issues. These added administrative costs divert funds that could be used for patient care. Simultaneously, Medicare and Medicaid rates have not kept pace with the cost of providing care, and in many instances are below the cost of delivering the care. Private payers have reduced payments dramatically using federal payment levels as guidelines. We all know the payment system is broken. How should it be fixed? I believe the way to heal our payment system is to restore the patient-physician relationship by ensuring that patients have the right to privately contract with a physician of their choice without onerous penalties, regardless of the presence of a private or government third-party payer. The importance of this point cannot be overstated. Medical decision-making would once again be in the hands of patients and their physicians. This will enhance patient choice, heal the ailing payment system, and once again restore the best medical care system in the world. We hear a lot about the high cost of medical care in our country. Please consider the difference between medical care costs versus medical care expenditures. While the cost of many specific procedures and therapies is actually lower today than in years past, we now expend much more for care because more patients have access to more tests and therapies that simply were not available in years past. We can significantly reduce health care expenditures by enacting proven, effective medical liability reform measures that will eliminate the need for so-called defensive medicine. As an early adopter of electronic medical records, I will caution you not to overestimate the savings from advances in health information technology. We must continue to guarantee patient privacy and ensure that medical records are kept confidential. However, regardless of whatever reforms are enacted, we can preserve patients' access to quality medical care only by ensuring the rights of physicians and patients to privately contract for care. I appreciate this opportunity to present the views of a practicing physician to you today, and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Dr. Williamson. I just want everyone to know we have three votes. We're going to hear from Dr. Gowande, and then we'll break and come back right after the votes for questions. So we'll ask the panel to stay. Dr. Gowande. Chairman Pallone, Ranking Member Deal, and distinguished members of the subcommittee, it's an honor to be speaking to you today about repairing our ailing health care system. As a clinician and observer, this is what I see. Our health system is failing, and 
on cost, coverage, safety, and value because healthcare itself has become so immensely complex. I'll try to explain. The new edition of the International Classification of Diseases identifies more than 68,000 different diagnoses that we now know a human being can experience. And science has given us beneficial remedies for most of them with more than 4,000 different procedures and 6,000 different drugs. But the remedies are rarely simple. Each involves different steps in care, risks and uncertainties, often expensive technologies and complex coordination. This extreme complexity has produced failures of coverage and of execution with large numbers of patients experiencing inappropriate treatment, avoidable infections, and other forms of costly harm. These failures reveal that the structure of our health system is not suited to what we've learned is required for good care. It has three main problems. Human beings need preventive and acute care throughout our lives, including costly medications, procedures, and hospitalizations, yet most Americans lack coverage for significant stretches of time. The system doesn't measure its successes or failures. And third, the system has no reliable mechanism for deployment of practical knowledge, for ensuring, in other words, that important discoveries actually reach the average American. The result is a troubling mismatch. We are an industry of highly skilled and extraordinarily hardworking individual professionals, but we work in a structure where no one is aware of, let alone responsible for, the overall effects of what we do, whether for our patients or the economy as a whole. This reality, I want you to know, comes home to me weekly. Recently, I helped care for a critically ill woman in her 60s with a severe abdominal pain. Insurance coverage troubles may have played a role. She had, had not seen a doctor in 15 years and had multiple preventable problems. To save her, I operated to repair her ruptured colon. A cardiologist treated her subsequent heart attack. An intensivist managed her pneumonia. And a vascular surgeon tried to rescue her foot which had become gangrenous and would have to be amputated. She didn't make it. It was all too much for her. But there was a moment when we thought she'd pull through. And as we contemplated it and considered that when she went home, she'd be unable to walk, unable to eat for months, and have a large open wound, someone asked, who's going to be her doctor? Who's going to take care of her? The silence was deafening. The answer, of course, was that we all needed to be her doctor. Each of us would see this woman in our clinics for one of her problems, but we had no real mechanism, let alone incentives, to work as a team and ensure that nothing fell between the cracks, that we all worked in a common direction for her. The great satisfaction of medicine is to have skills that help people and to be rewarded for using them. But there is also a constant demoralizing recognition that one is but a white-coated cog in a broken machine. Our present structure of healthcare, with its gaps in coverage and value, has set us up for failure. A better health system requires a few new capabilities. For one, it must provide coverage for people without it, a kind of lifeboat for those left out or dropped from care. And over the next few months, we're going to be hearing you argue until we're all blue about whether that lifeboat should be a public program, a private program, or both. But the key is that the coverage must be there and it must be ad adequate. We must simply take that step. Just having an insurance program, though, will not make health care better, safer, or less costly. We must also outfit the system to measurably reduce failures and increase success in healthcare delivery and thereby increase the value of our immense investment in healthcare. And that requires doing three new things. Number one, we have to measure national statistics. We must measure in real time the results and value of care nationally. How many Americans suffer hospital infections, die from surgical in uh, complications, and other basic indicators? Our current data measurement is inadequate, uncoordinated, and at least three years out of date. This is one-sixth of our economy, and not having these measures is not like not knowing our unemployment or inflation rate. Second, we have to support discovery of practical know-how. We spend $30 billion a year seeking new scientific discoveries, but little to identify how hospitals and doctor's offices can put them all into effective use. This is vital, life-saving research. My team at Harvard and at the World Health Organization, for example, devised a 90-second safe surgery checklist that was found to reduce surgical complications and deaths by more than one-third. We need more solutions like these, basic team checklists for everything from heart attacks to infectious outbreaks. 
And we also need investigation of the complex solutions you heard about today, such as how to organize and bundle payments for teams to be more effective for care and wellness and measure what's happening with them. And third, we need to coordinate deployment. At present, new knowledge, like that safe surgery checklist, takes more than a decade to reach most Americans because no one is responsible for ensuring dissemination. A reformed system must therefore support active deployment. I'd like to see this work consolidated in a National Institute for Healthcare Delivery, but it can be done through existing agencies like the National Center for Health Statistics, the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, and insurers like Medicare or a coverage program for the uninsured. The debate about how we'll do any of these things will be fierce, but we must do these things if we want a better health system, and the goals are achievable. By 2013, we can virtually eliminate personal bankruptcies due to health care debt. We can make health care measurably more effective, including reducing the number infe of infections picked up by hospitals, in hospitals by 50 percent, by becoming the first country in which cardiac disease is no longer the number one cause of death, and by reducing major complications and deaths from surgery by at least a, th a fourth. We can improve the ability of clinicians to do their jobs by reducing the burden of insurance paperwork by at least 50 percent. And we can cut overall health inflation by at least half by 2013 and ensure no business has to spend more than 15 percent of payroll on ordinary health coverage. Health reform is not going to produce a utopia, but we can have transformation, which is to say we can do more than just catch up to other countries. If we follow through on this work, we'll have the most effective health care system in the world. I thank you. Thank you. You, you went over, but your optimism is, uh, is uh, makes me feel good. <laughs> um, what we're going to do is um, we have about half an hour approximately for votes, and then we'll come back. So we ask you to stay here, and then when we come back, we'll have uh, questions. So we're in recess. <laughs>